All right, so we're starting with uh, section 10.2, where we're going to talk about vectors. Um, this is going to be two video section. Uh, we're going to have two videos for this section, and this is going to be the introduction to vectors and what they actually are, a little bit of vector operations and things like that. And then we'll do, the second day will be some of the calculus applications of vectors. So let's go ahead and jump in. Some of this may be, if you've had physics and talked about vectors and learned about vectors, a lot of this is going to be reviewed, but some of it's not. And some of you, if you haven't had physics, well, it's not going to be, none of it's going to be reviewed, but you need to know about it. You need to know how it works. All right, now quantities that we measure that have magnitude, but not direction are called scalars. In other words, it's just a magnitude. It doesn't matter what direction it, it's going in, anything like that. Uh, sound would be a scalar. Uh, the volume, yeah, well, okay, never mind. It, 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 may, it may or may not. But if you're not worried about the direction, you're only worried about how what the magnitude is, and it's not in a specific direction, it's called a scalar. Now, quantities such as force, displacement, velocity that have direction as well as magnitude are represented by directed line segments. That is a vector. So here we have a directed line segment, directed in that it's going, it starts here and moves in this direction this, at this magnitude. So we know specifically what direction the magnitude of whatever it is is going to be exerted in or directed in or whatever it specifically requires. So A is our initial point, B is our terminal point. And we mark that as ray AB, that's also known as vector AB. And the length is signified by, it looks like the absolute value of AB, but it's actually read the magnitude of AB. So the length of this thing is the magnitude of whatever our thing that we're dealing with is, whether it be force, displacement, velocity, or whatever. The length of it signifies the magnitude of that uh, quantity. Now, a vector is represented by that directed line segment that we've been talking about. Vectors are equal if they have the same length and the same direction. In other words, the same slope. So any vector that has a length of AB here and that here it goes in that exact same direction, has the exact same rise over run in the same direction, then those vectors would be called equal vectors. All right, now a vector is in standard position if the initial point is at the origin. Now, don't get this confused with standard position for an angle. If you remember, for standard position for an angle, its initial side, not initial point, is on the positive x-axis. The vertex is at the origin, and the terminal side is somewhere else. That's standard position for an angle. Standard position for a vector, all we know is the initial point is at the origin. Now, the component form of this vector breaking it into the x part and the y part is going to be v1 comma v2. And notice here we have the pointy uh, parentheses things around that. That signifies that it's a vector. Also, we name vectors with lowercase bold letters or lowercase letters that have a little arrow thing over the top like this. 
similar to what we were looking at with the ray just a second ago uh, from a, for AB. So you can either write it in bold or you can just put the little arrow thing over the top. That's how you name vectors. Your component form of the vector has an X component and a Y component. Notice that this is the terminal point here, so you'd have to go V1 and then V2 to get to that endpoint. So there are the, your two components. So we're back to triangle tree again with a lot of this stuff. All right, now the magnitude or the length of vector V, which is signified by V1, V2 here, is the magnitude of V, remember the absolute value means magnitude, is equal to the square root of V1 squared plus V2 squared. Now all that is, guys, is the distance formula. We're just doing the distance from the 0, 0 point to the V1, V2 point. So we have V1 minus 0 quantity squared and V2 minus 0 quantity squared. So that's where those actually come from. That is nothing more than the distance formula. So a lot of these formulas that we learn come from stuff we've learned way back. Remember that. We just used to learn, we just learned to use it in a little different way or a more applied way. All right, so the component form of VQ or of PQ is the vector negative 2, negative 2. So these are equal vectors. And its magnitude is going to be the square root, or sorry, yeah, the square root of negative 2 squared plus negative 2 squared. That's going to be 4 plus 4, which is 8. Squared of 8 gives me 2 squared to 2. So that's going to be the length of this thing right here. Now remember, the vector can be anywhere in the plane, but it's in standard form when we're thinking about it coming from, or when we have it coming from the origin. All right, now if the magnitude of V equals 1, then V, then vector V is a unit vector. Now if we have the vector 0, 0, that is the 0 vector and it has no direction and it has no magnitude. All right, now vector operations, there's a lot of different operations we can actually do with vectors. Uh, probably the easiest is going to be the addition and subtraction, but let's talk about a couple different ones. We're going to let u equal u1, u2, and v, vector v be v1, v2, and let's let k be a scalar, a real number, not a vector, um, and let's look at some of the operations we can do. Well, the first one is adding two vectors. Now, if you're going to add two vectors, all you're going to do is you're going to add your components. So here, the x component and the y in the x component of the two vectors are added together, and the y component for u and the y component for v are added together, and that's going to give us the vector, the sum of the two vectors that's going to be represented by the vector u1 plus v1 comma u2 plus v2. So when you're adding vectors, you're just going to add the x components of both vectors or even all three vectors or four vectors or however many, and the same thing with the y components. All right, when you do subtraction, guess what? You're going to do the exact same thing, but you're going to subtract the components. So here we have u1, u2 minus v1, v2. 
the u vector minus the v vector. And once again, just subtract your components. Don't forget to subtract though, u1 minus v1, u2 minus v2. Remember the u1 and the v1 are the x components, so we're keeping those together, and the u2 and the v2 are the y components, and we're working with those together. All right, now another thing that you can do with a scalar is you can actually multiply by a scalar. And all you're going to do to that is just distribute the k value all the way through both parts of your vector. So remember, vector u was u1 comma u2. Well, if we do k, some number times unit u, or vector u, we're going to have k u sub 1, which is the x component, and k u 2, which is the y component. So we're just going to distribute that k all the way through. All right, now if we make a, a vector its opposite or its negative, we're just multiplying through by a scalar of negative 1. So all that's going to do is it's going to change the sign of both or all components of the vector. Now, I started off with both and then I said all. Well, the thing is, in two-dimensional space, this is a vector. It has two parts. If you get into space, if you get out of the plane and into space, then there'll be a u1, a u2, and a u3. There'll be three components to any vector. And if they get into more dimensions than that, then they'll have more things than that. But that's how it works. All right, so let's look at vector u and vector v, and we're going to add those together. When you add them together, you're going to do tail or head to tail. So the head of the first one goes to the tail of the second one that you're adding. And then our resultant, that's what we get when we add or do any operation with vectors. We get a resultant vector. The resultant vector is going to go from this point right here, the beginning of the first vector, all the way out to the head of the second vector. Now, another way that you can do it is you can do it with what's called the parallelogram mode. That's what this is right here but just the head to tail method works as well. But this is the parallelogram where we actually do the V and then the U on the other side where we did the U and then the V here. Notice both, the heads of both of those, regardless of which way we added them together, ended up at the same place. That tells you that the commutative property does work with vectors with vector addition anyway. All right, now if you need to find the angle between two vectors, it is given by the equation the theta is equal to the inverse cosine or the arc cosine, remember it's the same thing, it's the one that finds the angles of u1 v1 plus u2 v2 all over the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v. Now notice here we're multiplying the x components together, we're multiplying the y components together, and then adding the two sets together. And then we're dividing by the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v. That will give us a number that is going to be below 1, but greater than negative 1, somewhere in there, somewhere in that negative 1 to 1 range. And then we take the inverse cosine, and that gives us the angle. Now this comes from the law of cosines, and you can see page 524 for the proof if you're interested in it. Now the dot product, also called the inner product, is defined as u dot v 
is equal to the magnitude of U times the magnitude of V times cosine alpha. Now if you recognize this, this is kind of moving around some of the things that we just had because we had U times V in different places. But anyway, this is the equation and the magnitude of U times the magnitude of V times the cosine of theta is U sub 1 V sub 1 multiplied together plus U sub 2 V sub 2 multiplied together. So that is called the dot product. So for instance, if we wanted to do the dot product of the vector 3, 4 with 5, 2, we're going to have 3 times 5 plus 4 times 2. Now you'll notice here that when we do the dot product, it's not another vector. It's a number. It's telling us something about the vector. So we end up with 15 plus 8, which gives us 23. So not now don't get this mistaken, that is not the magnitude of the new vector, it just gives us information about it. And different uh, applications use that dot product in different ways. Now this could be submitted in the form, substituted in the formula for the angle between vectors or solved for theta to give theta equals the inverse cosine of u dot v over magnitude of u times the magnitude of v. So there's the dot product right there. If you take that dot product and divide it by the product of the magnitudes and then take the inverse cosine, you're going to find the angle between the two vectors. And we can see that because u dot v is this thing right here. And if we go back just a little bit, what we see when we looked at the first equation? u1 v1 plus u2 v2, and that's replaced by the dot product. All right, so find the angle between vectors u and v. So we know theta equals the inverse cosine of u dot v divided by absolute value, or sorry, magnitude of u times the magnitude of v. All right, so when we go to put everything in, find the dot product on top, find the uh, magnitudes on the bottom, and then we'll divide that and then take the inverse cosine. So we've got the inverse cosine of um, 2, 3 dot negative 2, 5, and the magnitude of 2, 3, and the magnitude of 2, 5. Now, the way you do that, of course, we've already discussed it. I'm not going to show you everything, but we've got 2 times negative 2 plus 3 times 5 for the dot product on top. And then down here on the bottom, remember, we're going to do the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared. This one squared plus that one squared, that'll give me, then take the square root, that'll give me the length of that thing. So this one would be the square root of negative 2 squared plus 5 squared. So here we're going to have 11, here we're going to have 25, and up here we're going to have, uh, hold on, that's not 11, that's 13. Uh, up here we're going to have 11. We're going to have negative 4 plus 15, which gives us 11, over the square root of 13 times the square root of 29. All right, so, and then we're taking the inverse cosine of that, of course. So we find the decimal version for this, and then take the inverse cosine of it to find what angle goes along with that cosine value. And we're going to find that it's about 55 and a half degrees or approximately uh, almost one radians, but it's 0.9685 radians. All 
All right, so let's look at an example. We may not work it out, but we're going to talk about all the ways that you can break this thing down. Um, a Boeing 727 airline flying due east at 500 miles per hour in still air encounters a 70 mile per hour tailwind acting in the direction of 60 degrees north of east. The airplane holds its compass heading due east, but because of the wind, it acquires a new ground speed and direction. What are they? All right, so if the airplane is going directly east at f and it's driving itself that way at 500 miles an hour, that would be the first part that you're going to draw in. That's the first part of your resulting. You're trying to find what is the resultant of all the forces acting on this plane. So there is your 500 miles per hour uh, plane going due east. And then we have a 700 mile per hour tailwind acting in the direction of 60 degrees north of east. So east is the first one. We're going to go 60 degrees up towards the north. So we've got a tailwind that's working off in this direction right here at 60 miles per at 70 miles per hour. All right, now our resultant is going to be what we end up with when we add these together. Now remember, this is tail to tail. It's not head to tail, and to add these, we would have to put them head to tail. So we'd have to, have to draw this thing out here. But we don't want to draw it. We want to calculate it. So we need to find the magnitude and the direction of the resultant vector u plus v. So we already know what it's going in what direction, what's going in the other direction. With this first drawing here, what do we know? the entire force of that 500 miles per hour is going due east. So when we draw in our little parallelogram, that right there is my resultant vector. It's u times v. Even if they don't draw it on the, on the board, that's how they come up with this solution. So u times u plus v. All right, so the component forms of U and V are the component for U is 500 comma zero. And here with the 60 degrees, what do we know our sine and cosine are for 60 degrees or pi over three? Well, we know that V is going to be broken up. The X part has its cosine. The y part is sine, so we've got 70 times the cosine of 60 degrees, comma 70 sine of 60 degrees. Now, when we do the 70 times the trig function, remember that's going to give us the amount that's going to go in that direction. So the 70 times cosine 60, that's going to give us the direction of this 70 uh, mile per hour thing in the x direction. This part over here, because the sine will give me how much of it actually went in the vertical direction, because that's the way sine measures vertically. Remember, your sine is your x value, or sorry, your y value, and your cosine is your x value. So we're going to get roughly 35 and 35 square roots of 3. You should be able to do that by hand, knowing the cosine of 60 or pi over 3 and the sine of 60 or pi over 3. Uh, cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half. Sine of pi over 3 is squared 3 over 2. All right, so then when we add these together, u plus v, we're going to end up with 535 for my x component and 35 square roots of 3 for my y component. So that is the component form of my red resultant vector here. Now if I want to find the magnitude, I just plug it into my distance formula. 
535 squared plus 35 squared to 3 squared, and we're going to get that the magnitude is about 538.4 miles per hour. So that's the length of this thing, which is also signifying the speed of the airplane. Now, using the triangle here, we can actually find what my dimensions are. I know that this is 535, that's the X component. With what we're looking at here, we're not actually looking at the, rec at the parallelogram anymore. Now we're looking at this thing right here, where that's the right angle. So we're looking at the right triangle. So this thing right here is 535, and this, ver this side here is 35 square roots of 3. So that's where that comes from. And with respect to my angle here, theta, we're dealing with the opposite and the adjacent, and that's going to be tangent. So the inverse tangent of 35 square roots of 3 divided by 535 is going to give me what the value for this angle right here is. Now, for some of these applied problems, you're probably going to want to go ahead and put it in degrees because a lot of times they're going to use degrees instead of uh, radians. And you're going to get that that is about 6.5 degrees right there. So what is the resultant vector? Well, it's 538.4 miles per hour and it's 6.5 degrees north of east. Now, why is it north of east? Well, because this is east right here, and where does this line go? It just went 6 or 7 degrees, depending on how much you want around this, 6.5 degrees up, and it's going in that 538.4 degrees along that line, and that's where the wear comes in, or in what direction it's going. All right, so the new ground speed of the airplane, and that's the relative speed to the ground, is about 538.4 miles per hour, and its new direction is about 6.5 degrees north of east. That's how you break down your vectors. You're going to break them down into X and Y parts, and then you can add, subtract, multiply, uh, multiply by a scalar. There's all kinds of different things you can do with them. But more important, most importantly, is that you can add them together and get things like this. This is how, how the plane's actually traveling, even though the plane is keeping a heading of direct east, because of the tailwind of the, of the plane, it's actually going to blow it off course, and it's going to go along that way. If you didn't know how to do that, then there's no telling, you know, you get up flying a plane in a windy area, there's no telling where you may end if you don't have... Uh, relationships with uh, ground things on the ground that you can actually guide by. Alright, that's all of day one. That's an introduction to vectors. We'll talk about more calculus with vectors in day two.